Welcome back to the Life Support Podcast. Thanks for listening. Just a heads up that Gen C was out this week, so you just have me. I have our guest, Dr. Lynn MacArthur, here to talk to us about eating disorders. And in fact, we had such a great conversation that we're breaking it into two parts. So here's part one. Before we get started, just a quick reminder to hit that subscribe button and like us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Hey, Life Support listeners. Thanks so much for tuning in this week. Unfortunately, you just have me. So sorry. But fortunately, uh, we get to talk to Dr. Lynn MacArthur this week about eating disorders and the work that she does in her practice and really what's been happening in the larger sphere of eating disorder work. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Lynn, could you uh, give us your name, your pronouns, what you do when you're not working, what you do when you're when you are working? Sure. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you for having me today. I'm very excited to be here. I'm Dr. Lynn MacArthur. I'm a psychologist at Health West, a federally qualified health center in southeastern Idaho. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I live in the Pocatello, Idaho area, um, just outside of town in a little ski hill uh, town. And I love a lot of outdoor activities. I like camping, hiking, I am an avid tennis player. Um, I love traveling, hanging out with my family, cooking. Those are most of the things I like to do when I'm not working. Uh, When I am working, I um, currently do about two days a week of uh, clinical work and about three days of administrative work running our program here at HealthWest. In those two days a week, I primarily see folks who are recovering from eating disorders. Um, And that's something that I started maybe... About six or seven years ago, after seeing the need in our community, um, eating disorders are a pretty specialized field, and many therapists were hesitant to uh, really tackle eating disorder um, recovery for a lot of reasons. One is that they feared maybe taking on something that they didn't know enough about. Many training programs for mental health professionals and medical providers touch on, if anything, eating disorders and really don't spend a lot of time focusing on on that area. And a lot of our culture in general is pretty diet heavy. And many of us hold a lot of biases about weight, food, exercise um, that can do some damage when it comes to treating folks who are in recovery. So that was what drove me to learn more about them, attend a lot of trainings about eating disorders and start um, building up my support network to learn more about them so that I could treat folks who are in recovery without doing additional harm. Fantastic. Well, we're so excited to be able to talk to you more about that today. And I think that probably um, if you're if you're not in that world, if you don't have that expertise, probably the exposure that you get to eating disorders is the pop culture one. So for, for our listeners that aren't really... Um, familiar with eating disorder work. Can you give a general 101 of what eating disorders are and who they impact? I'd love to do that because I agree with you. I think there's a lot of pop culture information about eating disorders. And and I appreciate that, especially uh, TikTok has a lot of information about many mental health disorders, including eating disorders. I think that is awesome. I was just talking with one of my students in supervision about um, how we're starting to destigmatize mental health through social media, but sometimes it's taking it to the opposite extreme of putting out a lot of information that without being received in an environment where you're talking with an expert who kind of understands, okay, this is disordered eating versus an eating disorder, for example. So um, we can talk more later about that if you'd like. But anyway, back to the eating disorder 101. Um, eating disorders are all about extremes, extremes ac- extreme actions related to food, extreme thoughts about food or exercise or body image, extreme feelings about food, exercise or body image. Um, they're usually very secret. Folks really work to keep it under wraps in terms of what they're doing um, to either over or underfeed themselves um, or how they're feeling about their body image. There's a lifetime prevalence of about 9% in the U.S. So um, in a person's lifetime, um, there's about a 9% risk risk of developing an eating disorder. Interestingly, during COVID, that went up in uh, 2020, 2021, 2022. Um, the prevalence rates look like they might have increased a little bit for those years. 
the underserved, so marginalized um, folks in our society tend to be not very well diagnosed with eating disorders, and they're also a lot less likely to get help. They're the second deadliest mental health disorder. Follow, they're second in line following opioid use disorders. Um, so understanding them, medical and mental health professionals helping identify them and get get people the help that they need is extremely important. About a quarter of people with eating disorders will attempt suicide at some point in their lives. So there's also a high co-occurrence of suicidal ideation or suicide attempts. And interestingly, and in, in when I talk with medical professionals about eating disorders, one of the things that they know that they're looking for, which is awesome that they're looking for it, but is being underweight because that's um, not always an indicator of an eating disorder, but can be. Um, but I think most people wouldn't realize that only about 6% of people with eating disorders fall in that underweight category. So eating disorders affect, can affect anyone, regardless of their body shape, size, weight, gender, age, um, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, they can really affect anyone. And in fact, in recent years, we've seen um, higher numbers of eating disorders in um, boys, young boys, um, in kids around age eight. Um, that's been another group that has increased in recent years. And also in the older adult population, um, because there are a lot of risk factors that can happen later in life, like the emergence of chronic health conditions that can actually trigger the onset of an eating disorder. Another important fact is that once you've had an eating disorder, you're more at risk of developing another one. So I'm really careful when I work with folks with um, an eating disorder like binge eating disorder. I want to make sure that we're working on um treating the body with honor and respect and balance as opposed to focusing on something like restriction because someone with binge eating disorder is actually at higher risk of developing a restrictive eating disorder. And when I'm working with someone with an eating disorder, the thing on my mind is do no harm. And that's something that, um, that I would encourage everyone to kind of think about when they are dealing with either you know, if you're a mental health professional listening to this podcast or a medical professional or a parent or a friend, think about how can I try to help without doing additional harm. That's that's great. Thank you so much for that overview. I, I want to invite you to check me on my language if uh, at any point, because it's it's just a learning conversation for, for me and for our listeners. Circling back to... Um, I think the idea of um, what many of us might have in mind when we think about somebody with an eating disorder, um, and again, just kind of that popular depiction of somebody who's very underweight. Can you talk a little bit more about maybe the experience of somebody in a larger body who may not be as, you know, visibly um, experiencing an eating disorder um, and what you see in your practice, because that seems like that's something that's coming to light a little bit more, but still isn't on everybody's radar okay. that an eating disorder isn't just this type of body. I love that you bring that up. I think in the last couple of years, we've had a few celebrities who have come out as having eating disorders. And many people were shocked and astounded because they thought, what? How do you have anorexia? And I think in our very diet-focused, diet-centric um, culture, our expectation is if you don't eat enough or if you overexercise, you will lose weight and you'll be super thin. Um, and that is definitely not always the case. In fact, we know that long-term um, toying with the amount of food that we take in can really have an impact on how our body metabolizes and processes food over time. So um, sometimes folks who have had kind of unpredictable food intake earlier in life or have done a lot of yo-yo dieting um, earlier in life, um, even if they develop, you know, that escalates over time and they start restricting more and more and more and more and more food, um, their weight doesn't always change. The body gets really good at storing fuel so that the body feels safe, right? So 
If I know, if my body knows that I'm not going to feed it well, I'm not going to take care of it, I'm not going to give it what it needs on a daily basis, it runs in a lower gear. It uses less energy. It conserves energy to stay safe. So it always has a reserve. And so I'm seeing that more and more in my practice, especially folks who have had a history of um, erratic food consumption, maybe with bulimia, um, with yo-yo dieting, as I mentioned before. Oftentimes they come to me and their um, medical provider might say, I need you to evaluate them for an eating disorder. I think maybe they have bulimia, maybe they have something going on, but something's not um, healthy here when it comes to their eating patterns. And once I talk with them, I realize it's really something more like atypical anorexia. I cannot say anorexia nervosa and be consistent with our current DSM or ICD, which are diagnostic and statistical manuals for diagnosing mental health conditions, with someone who's living in an, in a larger body or someone who's living in an a typical or average size body. Um, so the diagnostic criteria for anorexia nervosa do require um, a BMI below a certain level. There's been a lot of pushback by the mental health and medical fields about those criteria, though, because it really delays people from getting the care that they need, even if they're in a body that over time would get to a dangerously low weight. It takes a long time to get there. And so why wait to diagnose someone with all the behaviors, all the chronic daily feelings and thoughts related to poor body image and restriction of food when they have all of that? They just don't have a certain BMI. So I don't find the BMI to be an extremely useful tool or helpful tool. I will say I'm quite concerned when someone comes in and they're underweight because it puts them at higher risk for many other medical complications and mortality. And it's usually an indicator that their hearts could be affected, that, you know, there are other health conditions that might be impacted by their low body weight. Um, so low body weight is the weight that I'm I'm looking for as a risk factor, but I'm certainly not only assessing people who are in small to smaller bodies because folks who are in larger bodies can have the same symptoms, but their bodies just don't respond in the same way to food restriction. Great. I, I appreciate you highlighting that because it, I, I think it's probably a frame shift for a lot of people, um, again, that aren't in this work day in and day out in terms of what eating disorders truly look like. Um, so I, I think that that's important for for people to hear. You've touched on your work and the intersection with medical um, care too. Can you talk a little bit about how um, behavioral health teams and medical teams work together in the treatment of eating disorders? I'm glad you brought that point up to you, Rachel, because interdisciplinary care and the treatment of eating disorders at all levels of care from outpatient to inpatient care, all require a close-knit team, uh, making sure that they're taking care of that person's multiple facets of life. And I'm one that does believe that the mind and body are interconnected. Uh, it doesn't come anymore that way when it comes to eating disorders. We really have to look at all angles of a person's well-being to treat them effectively. I definitely am always working with um, my patients' primary care providers. I make sure that they have a registered dietitian who's a critical part of the eating disorder recovery team. And not just any dietitian, but one who's had special training or education or experience in the treatment of eating disorders. Because again, sometimes the treatment approaches that we take with someone who's not at risk for developing an eating disorder can actually be quite harmful if you don't realize that that person is experiencing eating disorder symptoms. So if I'm working with someone with an eating disorder, I want to make sure I know the, the dietitian that they're working with. A lot of primary care providers aren't very familiar with eating disorders. Primary care providers have to know a little bit about everything. And over time, patients who walk through their door with those common conditions they're quite skilled and knowledgeable about those. Eating disorders, though, not always. And so the majority of the time, if they're not real aware, I'm able to talk with them and guide them to some information and recommendations about labs and tests and other things to see how bone density is and how their labs are looking to evaluate more and work together to determine the appropriate level of care for the patients that we're working together on. 
Medical teams, though, for me, go beyond that. I've, if someone's struggling with bulimia, I try to make sure I get a release of information to talk with their dentist. And if they don't have a dentist, I get them to one. And one of the first safety checks we do is making sure that they're not brushing their teeth immediately after vomiting, because that is the cause of a lot of oral issues for many individuals struggling with bulimia. And many patients don't know that. And they have been trying to disguise the fact that they are vomiting after eating and brushing their teeth right away. And and that's probably the worst thing they can do for their teeth. So work with dentists a lot. Um, and I also work with cardiologists from time to time, GI doctors, some of the medical complications that are common in folks recovering from eating disorders are gastroparesis, uh, which is a slowing down of the processing of food in the stomach and the stomach muscles kind of get lax or spasm and and cause a lot of problems with digestion. Um, And so I, again, would want to let make sure that the GI doctor, the gastrointestinal doctor, knows about that history of eating disorder. A lot of times, primary care providers, I didn't mention it, but DEXA scans are indicated, especially for individuals with restrictive eating disorders during adolescence. Bone density solidifies up until our our mid-20s for most women. And so if you've had a disruption in nutrition, prior to that period, then a person is more at risk for the development of osteoporosis or osteopenia. So that's something that I'm working with primary care providers on too. And we all have to have a pretty good open level of communication amongst us. On our more um, high-risk cases where someone's kind of straddling that line between residential care and outpatient care, uh, we talk pretty frequently Um, Sometimes I even get guidance from medical providers. Given that I work in a medical clinic, I can take vitals at each session. And we're looking for certain numbers. If they fall below a certain number for heart rate, body temperature, blood pressure, then I know based on that, the guidance from that medical provider that I need to get that person to the ER. We're working together all the time. And in, in recovery, that communication is just crucial. Fantastic. I think that that's uh, super interesting to hear. I I learned a lot just in, in you highlighting what some of those partnerships look like. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't have thought about dental. So I think for providers or just the general community out there, it's really important to hear that there's that teamwork um, and kind of that handholding to support patients um, across medical and behavioral. Um, yeah. And Rachel got psychiatry. Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry that I... <laughs> I realized after I finished, I didn't even mention psychiatry, but they're crucial to you. Yeah. <laughs> and we do a lot of bracket for it. Perfect. I, I was gonna yeah. I was gonna joke that well, the, there's only like five of them in the state of Idaho, so so at least we didn't uh, at least we didn't upset that many people. Uh, just kidding. I I know that there's more psychiatrists than that, and I know where where uh, where you practice, but um, no, I, I think that that's fantastic too to highlight as well as part of the the treatment team. Also, you know, I think that that circles back to what what you said at the start of the conversation around um, co-occurring disorders as well. Um, so again, mm-hmm. thinking about how all of those um, components kind of intersect. Thinking a little bit more about um, how we talk about eating disorders currently in our culture, in the medical and behavioral health field, can you highlight some of the ways that we frame eating disorders, think about eating disorders, talk about eating disorders has really changed over the last 20 to 30 years? I think one of the ways that really stands out to me is for a long time, we really um, blamed families for the development of eating disorders. Um, I think as we've gotten away from kind of some older theories around psychology that put a lot of blame on parenting, um, that's been a relief to me because families are clearly not to blame. I think most of the time families do their best and families are trying to do the best by their kids. Is that always the case? No, but for the most part, you know, the families that I work with in the context of the patients that I see, they really want their child or mother or son or, you know, whoever it may be to heal and have a healthy relationship with food. Um, so I think for a long time, the way we conceptualized eating disorders was someone in the family really messed up 
And there's some sort of parent-child dynamic that we need to look at here. So that's been a, a very positive change in how we view the development of eating disorders. And that's not to say families don't have a role uh, when we look at all the different contributing factors to the development of an eating disorder, we now know that up to 80% is related to genetics. That really varies by study. It can be 28 to 78% um, of the variance related to the development of an eating disorder is related to genetics. So that's a huge range. We don't have a lot of great research on eating disorders, but that's what we do have. But there's also, you know, family culture around food, around eating. There's also psychological factors, um, a need for control. Oftentimes in eating disorders, we see folks who are either under controlled and feel a lot of things and struggle with dealing with those feelings and are quite sensitive to feelings. And I don't mean sensitive in a negative way. I mean that they pick up easily on feelings and experiences and have <clears throat> uh, strong reactions to things. But there can also be over-controlled people who struggle with eating disorders, which might be those who are more stoic, reserved, don't show a lot of emotion. They're always fine, right? They have a high need for being in control, being in control of their emotions and their actions. And so that's um, a concept that's been really helpful for me in the treatment of, of eating disorders is figuring out the need for control and where that came from. And it comes from a lot of different areas. And some of it is just purely genetic or temperament. But that can be helpful too, to help individuals healing from eating disorders, learn more about themselves and, and why they might control their food or not control their food in the way that they do. Going back to that question though, I think another thing we've learned in the last 20 years is eating disorders can affect everyone. If, if I think back to you know, growing up in the 80s and 90s, every depiction I ever saw of an eating disorder was an adolescent girl in the media, in magazines. Um, and I think we have done a much better job in the last 20 years of increasing awareness. We still have a lot of work to do in that area, but that anyone can be affected. Um, and in fact, there are certain populations who are more at risk for the development of an eating disorder. So I think that's something that has been critical in the last 20 years that we've we've started to talk more about. One thing in the mental health field that I feel like is starting to change is when I first went into mental health and I've been, um, you know, I started graduate school in 2003, so 20 years ago when I started learning a lot more about uh, mental health. But a lot of the messages that I received were, well, eating disorders are kind of an indicator of trauma unmet needs, OCD. And if we address all of those symptoms, then the eating disorder symptoms will just kind of fall away. We know that is not the case. Eating disorders are extremely complex and complicated and, and become very habitual and compulsive over time. And so while it is important to address those other co-occurring diagnoses as well, simply addressing those does not somehow just make the eating disorder fade away. Um, so I'm glad that we're learning more about that and mental health professionals are starting to take that to heart and realize that they might need some assistance from someone who knows more about eating disorders and some are seeking out more knowledge. So I think we're having many more conferences, trainings, continuing education opportunities when it comes to eating disorders. I'd also say in the last three years, we learned how important stress is to managing eating disorders. When I think about COVID, for example, the rates, as I mentioned before, prevalence rates of eating disorders went up quite a bit. Some statistics suggest as much as 15%. And people were seeking care at double the rate uh, when it comes to the NIDA, the National Eating Disorder Association helpline. Their calls, I think, approximately doubled um, during heavy COVID years, especially when we had a lot of social isolation happening. So I think the impact of stress on eating disorders, the impact of social isolation, the impact of not eating with others as regularly and decreasing that practice because many individuals suffering with eating disorders also eat alone where they don't have anyone asking them questions or asking them, oh, what are you going to order today? All of that practice went away for a couple of years. And I think that probably resulted you know, that's all speculation. But all of those layers of stress probably added to the resurgence of eating disorders. And there was a higher rate of folks reaching out for help who had been in recovery 
they'd been at places in their recovery that they felt had been sufficient. And then during COVID felt the need to reach out for help again, either due to a full-blown relapse or some kind of hiccups in their recoveries. I appreciate you just highlighting all of that in terms of some of the changes that have been made. Um, And then also some of the things that have happened kind of outside of the field that have pushed us towards a deeper understanding of really what's happening with eating eating disorders. I mean, I, I do think about like growing up for me that that depiction or that image of like the super tiny white teenage girl was what an eating disorder looked like. And I I think that it's good to hear that the whole field is moving towards thinking about more people um, being impacted by eating disorders. Well, that wraps up part one. A big thanks to Dr. MacArthur for her time. Tune in in two weeks for part two. In the meantime, like, subscribe, and remember to provide each other a little life support. Life Support is a podcast developed by CWHO with the support of the ISOS grant, where we talk to providers, experts, and others about their experiences with health and the systems that create it. This podcast music is written and performed by Anthony Leon. The show is also produced by Anthony. For more information, visit us on the web at CWHO.org, and remember to follow us on your favorite podcast app. Thanks, everybody.